Jagmeet Singh kicked off his election campaign from the Canada podium in, of the Canada Club in Toronto. He announced that he's going to cut the GST and that he's going to prove to everybody that Pierre Polyab is a liar. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. Jagmeet Singh was in Toronto at the Canada Club called uh, Canada's Podium, where he got to speak to a room full of supporters who were having dinner and basically um, admiring everything that he had to say. Or clapping that they did nonetheless. Unfortunately for him, some of us are paying attention, and there was complete and glaring contradictions. I mean, he would say one sentence something, and then she would, the lady would ask a question, and he would say the complete opposite. Now, there were a couple of subjects that were covered. I mean, it was quite long. I'm not going to play the whole thing for you, obviously, but I will play a lot of the questions. Now he sits down to ask the question, to have a Q&A with, the, I'll call her the host of the session. And the first question out of her mouth was about his the main announcement that he's making about GST. Why don't we start with the announcement you made? So taking GST, I, I wrote down heat, cell phones, internet, food. How's it going to work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we already made a decision in a lot of areas that are essentials that we don't apply GST. So right now, when you buy groceries, there's not GST applied to that. So that happens right at the till. When uh, we look at some of the essentials, we all need access to the internet. So cell phone and internet now is a crucial, vital thing that we need in our lives. We want to take the GST off of that as well. When we look at some of the needs for kids, when we're buying children's clothing or diapers, they still have GST applied to those. We'd remove it from those as well. So this could happen at the point of sale, and it would be removed immediately. No application, no rebate, just a direct removal. Acknowledging that these things are essentials, let's give people a break right now. So you know what is essential and what would bring the cost of all of that uh, stuff down as well is the carbon tax. But he, he didn't mention it in the whole thing. I'll, I'll let that cat out of the bag that he talks about the GST. Now, I was there when the GST was being initiated. I remember the protests. I remember how everybody was upset. I remember, especially in Alberta, when before the GST, they didn't have any sales tax at all. What you saw on the sticker was what you paid at the till. Truthfully, what he's talking about doesn't really make any difference. Like, not, not say, if you took the GST off of gasoline or if you took the carbon tax off. Now, that would have a significant impact. But to say that you're going to be saving uh, money on children's clothes or most of the food that you buy that's not, that is essential, that's not junk food, doesn't really carry a GST on it anyhow. Idea that he's going to make our lives less expensive by taking the GST off some of the most um, mundane items. The idea that he's going to be classifying the internet as essential, but not gasoline as essential, I, I find a bit bizarre. I don't know that I heard anything in his um, in his approach or in his uh, contention that was significant or just it just seemed to me when i was listening to it that it was just a variation of what Pierre Polyev said. Like Pierre Polyev said, we're going to take the GST off new houses, and Jagmeet Singh just wanted to say the same thing, but he, he couldn't say that about housing, so he said it about essentials. And that's a bit strange that he would try to lump, you know, baby food in with cell phones and not gasoline, right? Because if you're fuel, you know, just when I say gas, I, I mean diesel, I mean all of it. To say that you're going to take the off the home heating, but not off the diesel that drives the truck that drops off the home heating oil, that's... That's all very weird in my mind. When As you listen, you'll see that he, I don't really think he has a plan. I think that he's just talking to be heard. Like that he's like, oh, look at me, notice me. Here I am running for office. So the next question she asked was about the supply and confidence agreement. And of course, the same old company line coming out of the NDP, but I'll let you hear it from his, I'll let you hear it for yourself right out of his mouth. The, the driving force behind a lot of these increases, like we know that, Corporate grocery stores are making record profits, and we've got to go after them to stop them from ripping off people. We know that when it comes to housing, more and more corporate landlords are scooping up affordable homes and jacking up rent. We have to go after that. 
and they just didn't have the courage to do that. So it became very clear we couldn't stay in agreement with folks that fundamentally disagreed with how we can make life better for people. So now we're in a minority government as was before, and we've done that in the minority government during the pandemic. So we're going to go vote to vote. And we were able to secure wins for Canadians, so we're going to try to do that. Um, but ultimately it became very clear that the government wasn't prepared to do what was necessary to take on the real challenges of the day. And that's why we made our announcement today. So he doesn't sound prepared to take on the challenges of the day because he's allowing the government that he... Cl See, on the one hand, he says that that government is not looking out for Canadians, that they weren't prepared to take on the hard fights that Canadians need, that they weren't take, willing to take on the corporate greed. And yet he does nothing to stop them. He is the one that could stop them. We could stop them cold, dead in his tracks, right? We could make it happen right now that he goes in there first thing Monday morning and throws up a, uh, we're, we have, we want to have a no confidence vote. Of course, he's not doing any of that. He's just sitting in a, in a room telling you that he doesn't agree with the way the liberals were doing things while he allows the liberals to continue to do things the same way they've always been doing things. So I don't know that I, I think I have to agree with the, the people that are out there saying that him claiming to have torn up the supply and confidence agreement was just a stunt. It was just a, a bunch of theater so that he could get some votes from the unions because he doesn't seem to be worried about it, right? And we know that the unions right now are getting hammered from the liberal government. So even if we take out the rest of it and just look at what he, he claims to be his the people that he's looking after, he's not doing any of it. He's just letting it continue. So really, he might have, you know symbolically tore it up but the truth is is that it's still very much in in play she asked him a question about what he has a plan to do right and he was talking about in, in initiating price caps folks were worried about price cap as a strategy some economists have questioned whether this would be legitimate uh, and so we absolutely agree, agree with Ms. Weber that we need to put in price, place some price caps. We propose doing that in grocery stores. Okay. Uh, for our essentials, for our daily essentials at the grocery store, we need price caps on those essential items. This is something that France has done uh, to effect, and they've brought down prices significantly with this policy. So that's an idea that we'd want to bring into Canada. France has controlled, maybe I think it's 500 items of food that are price capped. They also don't, import any of the products from other places there's a lot of nuances and subtleties and remember he keeps talking to you about the grocery store but what do we do if it's uh an indian themed grocery store or an asian themed like a you know china themed grocery store how are we handling one of those eastern european themed grocery stores with all of these price caps Whereas in North America, we have corporations that one corporation owns 75 items in the store. Another corporation owns 300 items in the store. Another corporation owns 3,000. Everything from cereal to shampoo to, you know, like, so on the one hand, he talks about price capping. And then on the other hand, he doesn't mention cutting out the carbon tax. He doesn't mention, you know, making life more affordable for the greenhouse, which of course is one of the essential ways to make uh, food stable. You have to have a regular year round supply that doesn't come out of Mexico. Okay, so now we're gonna come into some real glaring contradictions. She, she asks him about the productivity issue. He really should have wrote it down or something. The, the amount of contradiction is, it's ridiculous. Uh, you touched on it in your remarks, the productivity issue. You know, the U.S. election is now decided. Trump's talking about tariffs of 10 to 20 percent. Canada has, to this point, not been excluded. Elon Musk muses about whether Canada is dying. And Carolyn Rogers, senior deputy governor of the Bank of Canada, has named our productivity issues an emergency. Well, I outline some of those areas. I feel like first we have to acknowledge that the past approach to economic growth was a very simplistic measure. People might talk it up, but it's really a simplistic measure and often a conservative approach, which is to cut taxes. This has been categorically proven false. We know this is not true. When you cut taxes for big corporations and we've seen them make big profits, they use those profits to pay out their shareholders, to increase dividends, to put more money into CEO bonuses. So here I think he exposes his lack of comprehension of the way the economy actually functions. 
I'm on the one hand, he says, oh no, when we cut, we're going to, when you cut taxes, it's a terrible thing. And then he says, because they use that money to pay people out, to pay out their investors. So you talk about productivity and you talk about the lagging economy. And then you say, well, those corporations, we give them tax breaks and they go right on ahead and give more money to the people that are invested in their company that they will then spend. And you say that it's a categorically been proven incorrect, which it, it really hasn't. I mean, it's actually the opposite cutting taxes to the businesses is categorically proven to be the number one way to repair the economy. I think that because Pierre Polyev has said it out loud, he has to just go against it. Or he doesn't understand in any way, shape, or form how to correct the productivity. But it's not, you know, he, he, he had more to say about the issue. And small businesses, medium-sized businesses, tell us their biggest barrier to recruiting new employees into their businesses to create the growth that they need is that they cannot find housing for the people that want to come to work in their companies. And that's a barrier that I hear again and again. So addressing the housing crisis is a productivity measure. It's going to improve productivity by giving places for people to live so they can work in those settings where there are opportunities to work. On the housing side of things, I talked about a couple of policies, banning large corporate investors from buying up affordable homes. The cost of living challenge that people are faced with mean that people are are constantly in worry that they're falling behind. The more we can bring down the costs, it's going to allow for people to be more productive as well. I I, I just love how in his mind he thinks that people are being going to be put in houses right beside the factory or right beside the warehouse. Right, like somewhere there's a corporation saying, oh, we, we, we're not doing well because our people have no place to live. And then he says, oh, no, we're, we're, we don't want corporations to buy up houses and drive up the rent, which I agree with him on. That's the only thing he said in this hour that I agree with, that you should not be permitted to come in and evict people and drive the rent up like some greedy little Scrooge McDuck. That should be illegal across the country. What should be price capped is square footage, right? We should be saying, okay, you want, you have a 1000 square foot apartment. It can cost no more than this. And if the landlords don't like it, if the corporations don't like it, then they can go find a different business. The man sits there in that chair and says that the internet is essential, but doesn't think that housing and homes are essential. I find that very, very bizarre. I find the the logic stream there to be a bit out of touch with what's necessarily happening. But I do admit with there's one thing that I agree with him that I I do not like these corporate landlords buying up, you know, t- there's some outfits in this country they own millions of apartments. And they go in and they say oh we're going to slap a bit of coat of paint on here and they take anybody that's living in the low housing, the affordable housing and they evict them and they do not let them come back. And those units need to be protected. I don't care. They have to be protected. I don't, I don't really care that some rich guy is going to not get as rich. And if he doesn't like it, he can go find a different business or she, they, whatever it may be. They can go find somewhere else. Because it's a fundamental right is a person to have a place to a roof over their head. It's a, it's a fundamental right. It's freedom of speech. It's food in your belly. And it's a place to live. However, he's not done talking about productivity. And uh, this is where one of... This is ridiculous, this answer. I think we do need to really focus in on uh, how we can build more of what we need here in Canada. Really having that approach of strengthening and supporting local manufacturing for the things that we need. Okay. Um, I want to touch on, on like, double-click on, on what you just talked about. Because many Canadian companies, large and small, would say it is harder and harder to do business in this country because taxes are going up, inter- inter- interprovincial trade barriers are are a real issue. So how are you going to incent Canadian companies to do the things that you've just talked about? Right. So um, we also need to acknowledge, I should have said this in the first question, part of the question, that that small and medium-sized businesses are very different from large businesses. And, And often you'll see new Democrat governments, when they're in power provincially, make that distinction very clear. We treat a large corporation, we should be treating a large corporation very differently from smaller startups and small and medium size. So we are going to propose in our plan 
this is a little preview, uh, a, <laughs> uh, to lighten the burden for small and medium-sized businesses. While we are proposing an excess profit tax on large, massive corporations, we want to lighten the burden, so lower, um, lower, let me say directly, less taxes for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises to support them in their growth. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure that he's listening to himself, because didn't he just say a couple minutes ago that the conservative idea of giving tax break to businesses is a horrible plan and never works. But he's just said now that he wants to give tax breaks to businesses because it will make productivity improve. He wants to cherry pick who gets these breaks. In a democracy, we don't do that. We say that you get a break or you don't get a break, period. Everybody plays by the same rules. Now, there are ways to go around it. He wants to impose an excess profits tax. He seems very jealous of all companies that are turning a profit. I don't know why he thinks that the idea that what we should do is make companies let make like the, the road to productivity is to decrease companies' profits. Unless they're under a certain size and then they get a tax break, which then again brings less money in. This is his, <laughs> this is the road to productivity that this gentleman is coming up with. And at no time is he talking about any of the things that are truly going to bring. I mean, I, I get there's some great ones. We make a lot of oil in this country. That should be locally sourced. Every pump in this country should have only Canadian fuel in it, made in Canada. <coughs> we bring fuel from Saudi Arabia and put it in our pumps. I think when he says small businesses, all he ever thinks about is a mom and pop grocery store. He doesn't think about the three guys who open up a garage or you know the, the four women who open up a cleaning service or... You know, any of a hundred examples. Then he says that he gets upset because those corporations give the payouts to their people. So if I'm sitting there as the CEO of a company and I got a million dollars, right? And I pay out a larger dividend to the people that, um, who are my investors, which, you know, don't make it, don't make it, don't get it twisted. When we, when we talk about that, we're talking about mutual funds and every person out there gets mutual funds from their work or they get mutual funds. They get, they take their money and they put it in there and the bank gets this big kickback. And then at the end of the year, you say, Oh, look, my, you know, one of my stocks is Walmart. And as a result, I got a $20,000 return on my investments this year. Let's all go to Florida or Bahamas or wherever. Let's all go on a vacation. Let's buy a swimming pool. Let's buy a new car. All the while telling you that this is a problem for him because they don't, he thinks that they should take that money and put it back into, I'm not sure what. Then he says, well, if you're making too much money, it's an excise tax. So the company's obviously got to spend it. They have no choice. If they don't spend it, they're just going to be giving it away. And that's not going to reflect well on their investors. And I, again, I, I point to the fact that it's mutual funds. So many of these investors are actually what you and I would refer to as bankers. They understand how money works. Unlike MP Singh, who seems to think that we can govern the country in the same way that the liberals do if we just don't copy, if we just don't say out loud that the conservatives probably have the best way to a smart economy and tell everybody what they want to hear. Sort of like Justin Trudeau light or 2.0 or something like that. Now the Stinner Theater has an audience participation so they got to ask a couple of questions of Jug Meat on their own. And here's one of them right now. In the aftermath of the recent US election, it looks more and more like Canadians will follow the US into a more conservative political landscape. Do you think this rejection of left-leaning policies and sentiments in the U.S. will be replicated in Canada? And if this is even marginally true, how will this affect the future of your party? Attack the premise of the question. <laughs> I think what happened in the States was not a rejection of left-wing. It was folks that were having a harder time. Life got harder for them. 
they are having looking at their paychecks and looking at what they can afford and things got worse. So the first word that pops into my head is cope. He's just trying to cope. There, there's not just the United States of America that has rejected left-wing policies. It's all over Europe. It's all wherever the left wing is cropping up. If they don't have, you know, the army behind them, they're being voted out of office. I mean, there are president there are people in the world that are stealing elections and, not, and refusing to give in to the to the winners. Right? We know that. The reason that the people, like he says, oh, we're looking at their port paychecks and seeing that their life is harder because of left-wing policies. It's not just the United States. It's so many countries who made the mistake of electing left-wing polit uh, politicians who, as I've always said, have terrible economic policy, Jagmeet included, and as a result, you end up going broke and your life sucks. You work your face off and you get no return. And of course, you're going to get elected out. Of course, people have had enough. They gave you a chance to prove that what you were saying was true. And it turns out that what you were saying was not true. And now they are giving countries a landslide victory. I mean, it's not just America and Trump. It's Germany. It's France. I mean, the, the French had to literally not run half of the party so that they could pool together the left-wing vote and even that only gave them thirds so i don't think that he's uh very astute in his assessment in my opinion <laughs> so as he wraps up he has to attack pierre polyev because you know his He's trying to steal half of Polyev's platform. Like he wants to make you think that he's a man of the people while he keeps the carbon tax in. He said six or seven times during this thing that the, you know, the environment matters more than people's houses and people's jobs and stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm not trying to tell you that the environment isn't important, but I'm saying to you that he's not presenting as anybody who he isn't, hasn't been in the liberal camp for the last four years. And all he can really do is say to you that he has to prove that Pierre Polyev is a liar. If they cut things like the dental care program for seniors and kids, that's going to hurt people. So we have to make the case that the conservatives are going to cost you. They're not going to make life more affordable. But you're in a tricky spot because your political opponent in the form of Pierre Polyev doesn't seem to be a friend to big business either. He's he's sort of navigating, trying to you know th thread a needle that I think I is it he's pro worker, he's not pro business. So where does that put you in terms of finding the space to communicate that to Canadians? Like I'm not going to deny that he's doing a great job of lying, and so I got to make the case that like look at who he really is and look at what he's done throughout his career. He's someone that has been a politician since his early 20s. Mm -hmm. A person who says that he is supporting, he's not supporting the government, but he's not trying to get the government out. A person who says that he's tearing up the supply and confidence agreement, but he's not doing anything about it. A person who talks that way shouldn't be believed, but he wants to try and convince you that Pierre Polyev is the liar, the guy who's successfully managed to get elected since his early 20s. I don't understand the logic behind the idea that, like, they, they want, they try to say, oh, Pierre Pauly has only ever been a politician, so he doesn't have any connection to the common man. But he grew up in, in you know, the lower middle class or the middle class, whatever it is. It's not like he lived in a big house like Jug Mead did. He went to private school. And Pierre Pauly went to public school, he took the train to get his education. Jug Mead, he went to private school in America, in the United States. And we all know Trudeau went to private school. So what, what I hear is a man who decided very early on that he was going to try and be the leader of the country. He's been a politician. And he, imagine if you said to yourself, oh, look, I got this electrician, and he's only been an electrician for five years, but he's the head of the union. Like So if we use like Jag Mead, he's only been the head of the NDP for whatever many years it is. We got this other uh, electrician who's been in, doing it for 25 years. Why is that a crime? Why is it like, why do we say, oh, this guy came out of high school and went right into electrician school and he became an electrician and he's been an electrician for 25 years. 
or whatever it is that Pierre Paulie has been a politician. I mean, if you take that experience and you put it in any other field, lawyer, doctor, truck driver, hairdresser, baker, coffee machine maker. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. Think about the idea of the experience that you've accumulated in doing it for half your life. Not to mention following the education path that leads to that. So I find that to be a very, very strange position that the, the, the NDP liberals are trying to throw at it. Like, I don't know why that in their mind, that is like, and I gotcha, but they say it so often that somehow in there, like it, it appears to me that they somehow think that that's a strike against him. I think that Jagmeet should listen to it, to this video and, and realize that he said so many contradictions that it, people will be looking at him like he's kind of a liar supplying confidence that he tore up he's done nothing about it he says trudeau's not good for the people he does nothing about it he says corporate taxes are not going to save the economy but then he says that people starting businesses need you know tax breaks so you know the idea that he says oh i know that pierre paulia was good at lying is a very arrogant statement that assumes that every person that hurts that, that it supports Pierre Polyev doesn't know what they're talking about. Only Jag Mead knows. See what you see the, the, the nuances that you got to pay attention to, right? What we're looking at here is an attitude that he knows better than you, which is exactly the same attitude that we've been seeing out of these liberal NDP far left politicians for years now. They don't want to listen to the will of the people. They want to tell the people what they're going to do. And if you don't like it, then they villainize you and call you names. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I will talk to you next time.